Production funding for Making It Up North is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. You take the leap, if you miss the next rock, the worst thing happens, you float back to the previous rock, you get out again and you start over. Reinventing yourself can be scary and inspiring. This time, explore creative lane changing with four people who've made the leap. A yurt in the woods is, is always a nice spot to find. I wish I had one in my backyard too. So Dudley Edmondson, I know you as a visual person, as a visual thinker. Mm -hmm. uh, how did photography kind of grab you? Photography was kind of one of those things that I felt like it was a good way for me to keep track of birds I was seeing. So uh, I've been a bird watcher since like 1980. 7980, and I kind of got into photography around the same time. And, uh, you know, I really, nature was something I picked up as a really young man. What brought you to Duluth? I decided I wanted to be a wildlife photographer and I wanted to photograph hawks. And I heard about Hawk Ridge, and so I moved here to um, be close to Hawk Ridge. In fact, my house, I ended up choosing a house that's right in the neighborhood below Hawk Ridge. And it's following your passion? I started in nature uh, in the, uh, you know, when I was a kid in Ohio. And so moving to Duluth is certainly following my passion and a continuation of that and, and uh, you know, not being afraid to take, take the chance. I mean, when I left Columbus, it was literally starting over again um, in a community where I really didn't know anybody. Uh, I met one guy named uh, Sparky Stensis, and that was really the, my first connection to people in Duluth. And I thought, if everybody in Duluth is as nice as this guy, I probably will do just fine. I think it takes some courage. Yeah, yeah, most definitely it takes a lot of courage to do that kind of thing. And I think a lot of people uh, find themselves um, unable to muster the, the courage to, to make a change, even though their daily lives are not great, but they don't have the courage to, to make that leap. Uh, I think about it like as being in a river and standing on a stone and knowing you need to, to move, continue down the river, but you're afraid to, to, to take that leap. And I think that um, that kind of thing keeps people sort of unhappy in, in one spot. And uh, I, I feel like you take the leap, if you miss the next rock, the worst thing happens, you float back to the previous rock, you get out again and you start over. But uh, not trying, I think people do themselves a disservice. bikes aren't just a toy they're, they're they're awesome and they're super fun you can't you can't beat a bike basically once we're in the woods it's just hanging out and riding and having fun it really does feel like being a kid I think people need some kind of passion and some kind of way to get outside I think bikes are a great way to do that that feeling of a little bit of adventure, a little bit of freedom, a lot of fun, and most of the people I ride with, in fact, all the people I ride with, they're just really good company. When I get on the bike and ride, it's like I feel free, you know? You want a fruit bar? <laughs> the ride food, I'll either typically put up in this bag, like right now, I've got, you know, some granola bars, um, fruit bars, and that sort of thing. We sell all kinds of these to customers. 
when they buy a bike because they're looking for a spot to put their phones nowadays, you know? It's very rewarding for me because, you know, that's what my background is with with uh, founding Granite Gear with my friend Jeff Knight um, and running that for, you know, 28 years. So that part, you know, of working with the fabric and stitching it together, um, that's all second nature to me. This one's the wedgie bag. Yeah. <laughs> it's custom made to the bike and it's made out of USA materials right here in Two Harbors, Minnesota. I'm Dan Crookshank. I'm the founder um, of Spoken Gear. We operate Cedar Coffee Company, Spoken Gear Cyclery and Outdoor, as well as Sodero um, Custom Bike Packs. The fun part is, uh, you know, building a new brand. And, uh, you know, I hope to do that with Sodero, you know, as well as we did it with Granite Gear. Well, I mean, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, but, um, you know, as long as you can get over that and just keep working at it and not give up. And I especially enjoy working with the people that I've hired, some great people, uh, and they've just come in and said they want to be a part of it. And um, that's a great thing. This for me is pretty ideal uh, because, you know, some days I am standing at the computer for eight hours, uh, but I am standing, you know, I have a standing desk, so that's great. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm designing something that the next day I'm going to get to spend most of the day on the machines and then we'll be on the sewing machines putting it together. So, you know, I never have to do that more than one day at a time, <laughs> which is awesome. Carl's operating the cutting table, and Nikki is uh, is our lead sewer, and uh, so together that team can can crank out a frame bag in in less than three weeks right now. So it's a kind of a style of uh, of bicycle touring to go with um, without the rack and panniers, and to have uh, you know frame bags. So this is one of the frame bags that we do custom. Sometimes I overpack, but yeah, this is basically just gonna be set up for a couple days. I got the fly fishing gear for the fly rod. Um, raincoat, this always comes with. This is a good raincoat, nice and small. Good wind shell. Um, yeah, the tent sticks. So, pocket knife and then bags for if I catch some fish. <laughs> Adding the fishing now with the fly rod, that's been super fun thing to add on, you know? Just kinda, I don't need a boat. <laughs> It's all here. To have, you know, our sponsored athletes, you know, complete the Tour Divide, which is, you know, 2,740 miles. So they rode from Canada to Mexico, doing 120, you know, mile a day average across the country. Not having any problems is kind of the greatest feedback, I think, you know, like, oh, well, you know, it worked. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Cedar Coffee. It is a bit of a reinvention, and it's like having three new kids, having three new businesses. It's very rewarding, and it's very, you know, it's a lot of work. Having the coffee shop, that's been a real big learning experience for me, but luckily I have a great staff of people. That part is, is going very smoothly now. You know, whenever I need to get some inspiration, I'll just go out and talk to people in the, in the shop and hear what they have to say. And, and uh, normally that'll, that'll get me inspired to get through the rest of the day. There's a huge group of people that are passionate about coffee and bikes. You know, they just want to get out and ride and talk about it and be together when they do it, so. It makes for more of a community around bicycles. Yeah, it's, it's a great place to be. It's a, it's a bright spot and it's fun.
Tell me a little bit about uh, creative lane changing in your life. I, I knew you as a still photographer. From probably the mid 90s to the early 2000s, uh, I was a professional wildlife photographer. I shot still cameras, I shot, um, you know, big DSLRs and, and massive lenses, uh, doing mostly wildlife, doing mostly bird uh, work uh, for encyclopedias and field guides and things like that. So that's kind of how I built my career uh, shooting that way. Um, <clears throat> but at a point uh, in the early 2000s, I, I realized that, um, you know, I wanted to do things a little differently. So uh, at that point, I, I, I kind of got out of the photography a little bit and got into writing. And so I went from working with an author and photographing his books to writing and photographing my own books. Was that about control? Was that about inspiration? What, what you fueled know, that? I'm a person, I feel like I need things to change about every three to five years or so, or I get really bored. Um, and it was about just throwing myself a, a monkey wrench in my plans, more or less, uh, self-sabotage even, because I mean, I was making good money, I was traveling the country a lot, but I was just starting to get bored, creatively starting to get bored. And um, so I decided that I wanted to, to write and photograph my own stuff. And so, um, so I did that, I spent about four years working uh, on my, my own books, um, and then in 2006, um, you know, those books came out. And then um, a couple of years ago, I think it's maybe been two years now, that I made another switch um, and got out of still photography work and into video production. This is a cherry burl, and uh, my philosophy in wood turning is very simple. I try to bring out the wood grain. I want to keep the bark on also, very important to me. Bark's part of the tree, it's, it should be there. In Hawaii, I met a wood turner. He took me into a shop and he turned the ball. I didn't turn one, but I watched him do it. It told me that that's something I can do and I, I, when I get home, first thing I did was take the North House basic class and then I just bought that lathe over there and uh, then I just started turning and uh, I just loved it. I'm Lou Pignolet. Uh, I'm a wood turner. <laughs> I live in Hovland. I, mean, I started off as a, as a chemist, came to University of Minnesota in 1970 and just Stayed there for 38 years. Did a lot of teaching and research in inorganic, organometallic chemistry, catalysts. Yeah, so the, the woodworking is certainly not something I have a degree in, but I'm teaching it, so that's that's good. I'm glad Northwest doesn't require a PhD to teach. I have a PhD, but not in wood turning. <laughs> But this is the key, this, the, the two wings up on top are the, are the key. But you know, I just learn by doing it. And I, so I develop a lot of techniques that other people don't do. And when, I, when I teach, I try to, to teach those techniques because they work for me. And, and I think that type of a slicing cut is a good cut to come up around the bend. When my wife and I moved here from the East Coast, I grew up in New Jersey. She's from Sweden. She grew up on the Atlantic Ocean, Sweden side. And we moved to Minnesota. There's no water here. Even though there's a million lakes, there wasn't any real water with big waves. And we discovered Lake Superior. 
in the early 70s, we came up here, we camped, we stayed at different places, and we saw some land for sale, <laughs> we just bought it. You know, there's something about the lake that is very magical. Um, it gives energy. I need to get the shape a little bit more tapered. I also have to check to make sure the bark's not going to be coming off. So here's where the glue comes in. <laughs> it's, if I don't apply a little super glue to stabilize these areas, if you turn bark edge bowls, um, not using super glue, you're going to be in trouble. So I, I can see it, the, you know, a lot of times under the bark, it, it's loose. It takes a few minutes to set up, but there is an accelerator, which instantly sets it up. Well, that's where my chemistry background comes in, too. I know exactly what this stuff is. <laughs> I, I think of everything on a molecular scale. That's part of, of the way I am, and the, the visualized molecules. So I picture the molecular structure of the wood sometimes. I know what causes the colors, the dyes, and all of this. And uh, Some of those colors that you saw when I turn that bowl will disappear. Other ones will appear because the air oxidizes. So I think there's always an advantage to be able to, to visualize things at a molecular level, whatever you're doing. So that, that helps with the wood turning. It helps in everything. I think what I do here is I can share through my Facebook, through my website. I interact with wood turners all over the world. It's, and it's really fun. And when somebody buys a bowl, it's, it's like a research publication. I mean, I make that analogy, except my research publications probably were read by 20 people. The bowls can be enjoyed by many, many more. <laughs> so, so there's more satisfaction in a way, making a bowl, having people really like it, and somebody buying it. I'm a very driven person. I need to have something intense to do that I get totally mentally and physically into. So, through my chemistry career and my research career, that's what made me, helped me be successful at that, was that drive. You know, the passion for work. <laughs> this is taking the place of that. I get into a zone and, and it, it, it's a total mental and physical uh, thing. Uh, it, I think it keeps me healthy, it keeps me motivated. I dream about it, I wake up in the morning thinking about the piece of wood I'm gonna turn and. You know, that's what keeps me going. You know, I can't remember exactly who it was that said it to me, but somebody said, wouldn't it be great if we had a musical about Dorothy that people could come every summer and see and raise money and... So uh, that put the bug in my ear six years ago. You guys ready? Let's get in our places. Dorothy was a pioneer. I don't know if I want to say ahead of her time. I don't know that she even paid attention to that. I think she knew what she wanted. She was trained as a nurse, wanted to you know, be educated, do a job, but also wanted to live in a certain unique place and found her way to do that. This past December was the 30th anniversary of Dorothy's death, and Barb's dad, Bob Carey, actually wrote her first biography, Root Beer Lady, which the musical is based on. I've been able to reconnect with my dad, even though he's gone, by doing this work. And of course, I'm intimate with that book now, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I read the book years ago, Bob Carey's Root Beer Lady book, and I reread it in November, and then I reread it again in June. I, I continue to be amazed at how she just did what needed to be done. And it's way too hot to be belly aching about it. The music part was fairly easy for me, but the dialogue wasn't. Pause, and then too hot to be crabbing about it, and then Dorothy says, too hot to be belly aching about it, okay? I've never done anything like that before. That's totally out of my comfort zone. So, but I knew that it needed dialogue to go with the music. Really? Yeah. 
I was, I was supposed, supposed to, to go, go fishing, fishing this morning. This I, don't know how morning. I, yep. I don't know how I got roped into making this root beer. So I worked on it a little bit. I would keep a notebook with me and I would write down thoughts and ideas. And I got a grant and I worked really hard on the script and then the grant allowed me to hire a what's known as a script doctor. And for four days she came here to the house and she and I sat down and worked on that script. Together we came up with it. Of course it's gone through many changes since then. I think it's been rewritten three times, three times, six times, something like that. But it, it evolves and it's still evolving. This will, this is not a finished production by any means. Okay, let's try it for Ruth again. So when Barb did the first staged reading last fall, where it was just kind of the first teaser of the musical and then she took feedback. Ely can be very critical. Those people, they're, they're the old school Slovenian group, you know, and they're pretty critical. And Dorothy was a legend. And so I had to make sure I got it right. And it kind of made it their story too then. You know, they feel a part of this production that's happening because they had a say in it. Like telling me to write a song called Quit Your Belly Aching, <laughs> which I would have never done if they hadn't told me they, uh, it needed to be in that play. <laughs> Dorothy had a sign on her island that said it was just a white, hand-painted sign with black lettering and of course you're supposed to think it looks like some Native American word and then people try to sound it out and then they get it, quit your belly aching. I mean I heard her say that a lot, quit your belly aching. Quit your belly aching, quit your belly aching, stop I've been telling people I am having the time of my life right now. This is the high point of my life. Pretty much if you put your mind to something, you can do it. You can do it. I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> this was my last big hurrah as a musician, writer. Um, I'm hoping maybe someone will take it and run with it down the road here so that for years it gets played in Ely or around the range. Minneapolis, who knows? I hope it does inspire other people who are musicians to think about, you know, expanding and getting outside your comfort zone a little bit. I, I never in a million years thought that I would end up doing this. It, it's a beautiful thing. Where does curiosity fit in your continuing evolution in deciding where you want to spend your time and money? Knowledge, whatever it is, uh, you know, whatever form it takes, uh, is almost like jumper cables off of a battery to my brain. Um, I just, it's like, this is new, I don't know this, <clears throat> you know, suddenly I'm alive and I'm like, you know, trying to take it all, take it all in and then I'll at some point want to build on it. Speaking of building, <clears throat> yeah. how does your new building fit in that curiosity? Well, uh, I didn't know how to build. <laughs> that was a huge learning curve for me uh, because I had been relying on a friend who I've known for many decades and he usually helped me with projects and he was only available for a short period of time. Uh, he helped me put the bones up um, I, I basically I wanted to build a nature observation structure in my backyard that was year-round. You know, there, it was a, an interesting little balance between, wow, this is exciting because it's new information, and holy crap, this could take me a month to finish, or two months. So in that process, mm -hmm. um, did you have a chance to reflect with a hammer in your hand? Uh, what it takes to, to learn a new skill, what it takes to reinvent what, what it is you want to be good at. Yeah, I certainly did, <laughs> but uh, it, it was, it was, the excitement was short-lived 
because it was just it was just an overwhelming amount of work. You know, in the end, the excitement now for me is I can't wait till 2018 or next year to build more things because now I have all these newfound skills and I want to put them to use and I cannot wait to I did build a bird feeder recently just because I was so excited about having new skills. Um, and, uh, but next year I plan to build a second deck and um, build some other structures and also do some repairs on the house. So what's your advice <clears throat> for someone who, who hasn't challenged themselves in that way or is considering a major change in their, in their life, in their direction? Just do it. Watch a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> but give it a shot. Um, y you, you'll find that, you know, if you're a person who's not, you know, you don't get hives from change um, or being uncomfortable uh, about knowledge, then I think in, at the end, you will definitely be happy that you did it. Most definitely. Thank you for taking yeah. time. Sure. Yeah.